Okay, so good afternoon everybody. Thank you for coming to this talk. Um, I would like to thank the organization of this uh, wonderful conference and having a great time so far. And also I and Oswald for encouraging me to um, submit this talk to the conference because I met him in PyCon Sweden three weeks ago. Actually we're like doing some kind of European tour of Python conference lately. So we end up meeting everywhere, this, like the same kind of people every time. So, well, right now um, uh, I'm going to talk about the Jupyter, formerly IPython notebook, because most of the people have been using it without knowing it or knowing it, more or less. Uh, and the tutorials is pretty famous, uh, but nobody has explained it so far what is it exactly about, what was the history of the, of the project. So, I'm going to take the opportunity to talk about it a bit, a little bit. And this is not going to be very, very technical, not about data science or machine learning, it's more about the history of the project, why it's important in the open science movement, uh, which I'm very interested into. And at the end of the talk, if I have time, I'm going to show a demo with some, um, some hints of what can we do with the IPython notebook and this multi-language capabilities, how can we combine different languages with the same interface. So there we go. Well, first of all, let me introduce myself. I'm an aerospace engineer at heart, while in reality I haven't finished my studies yet. I'd love to finish them in September, hopefully. Um, I'm a self-taught Python programmer because we used to study some programming at the university with Fortran 77, uh, but it was not enough for some purposes. So I started developing a growing interest in Python and becoming more and more involved into the, into the community. S specifically, we, um, we write in a blog called Pibonacci about scientific computing in Python in Spanish language. My Twitter handle is over my head, just in case you want to follow me. Um, I'm also the chair of the Python Spain Association, where we organize the Python Spanish Conference, which is going to be the third edition this year in Valencia, just in case you want to come. It's probably the cheapest Python conference in the world. <laughs> I, I promise, yeah, this is no, no joke. <laughs> um, I'm also finishing an internship in Airbus Operations where I develop all sorts of Python applications. And I have a personal project which I'm going to talk about in the Lightning Talks, just in case you want to come. But all I, I want to say right now is about rocket science. So please don't miss it. And talking about things that orbit, Let's get to the point now. Um, I would like to introduce in the first place an analogy that I like very much to justify why it's important the IPython notebook. Have you ever heard of the Russell's teapot? Anybody? Okay, some of you. Well, it is a metaphor proposed in 1952 by the English philosopher Bertrand Russell in the context of refutability of uh, arguments or statements or whatever. The only reason for it to be a teapot is probably because Russell was English had he been Spanish, it would be Garcia's cup of cafe con leche or something like that. <laughs> so basically, Russell suggested uh, this thing. If I say that between the Earth and Mars, there's a teapot orbiting around the sun in an elliptic orbit, but I say, no, you cannot observe it with even the most powerful telescope on Earth, well, then there's nobody that can prove it right or wrong, right? Um, and this was in the context, as I said, of refutability of an argument. This example can seem a bit weird, or out of context, but um, you will see that uh, many authors think the refutability of an argument is what makes the line between what is science and what is not. And we're going to see a very clear example of a Russell's teapot in the 21st century. So in May 2010, two economists from the Harvard University, Carmen Reinhardt and Kenneth Roth, uh, published an article in an issue without a peer review of the American Economy Review. The, um, claiming that when a country reaches 90% uh, of level of debt about its gross domestic product, its economy will recess. Okay, in 2008 there was the financial economic crisis which was still very recent and this kind of argument was used all over the western world to justify austerity measures, especially to your southern neighbors. <laughs> I think you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> But however, uh, 15th of April 2013, uh, almost three years later, there was another team in the Massachusetts University who was begging for the original data and the original analysis saying, you know what, um, these conclusions seem a bit weird to me, I would like to see the original analysis. And well, after three years, they found out that these con conclusions were basically rubbish because they were using like 
very dubious methodological procedures, uh, very strange statistical arguments, and there was an arithmetic mistake in the Excel spreadsheet. So if you've been uh, cut your salary lately, you can thank it to Excel. Okay, so this team published the data and the analysis uh, publicly online, so everybody could reproduce the R program that they used for the counter analysis and see what were the conclusions that were drawn for the, for the study. But even so, uh, is there a better way, like we can um, mix the text, the explanations, the analysis, the code? Well, it turns out that there is, so enter the IPython notebook. By the way, I just added some astronomical pictures just because I love them. Um, well, the IPython notebook, what is it exactly? Well, it's an interactive Python interpreter, just the IPython thing, but the IPython notebook is an interactive Python interpreter on the browser, okay? Uh, it's an open format too. In the end, it's a, just a JSON document where you can mix text, multimedia, code that you can execute and change. And change. Uh, it's inspired in the Mathematica notebooks, if anybody has used them, and it's based, uh, well, in the first place, in, on the Python programming language. Well, just an, as an anecdote, like uh, some months after the counter-analysis appeared, the Fernando Pérez, which is the creator of the IPython no notebook, asked on Twitter about mm, someone doing the analysis in, the, in a notebook format, and like two hours later, you already had it. So you can already browse it and see the, the conclusions of the Reynard and Rogoff study in an IPython notebook format. The power of the IPython is that it provides, as I said, a, let's say a, a method to combine all this uh, information together. So for me, it's been a perfect tool to do courses on Python programming language. I've been teaching Python to aeronautical and aerospace graduates and chemical engineering and stuff, people that are more used to tools like MATLAB or no tool at all, Excel, stuff like that. And there are many, many courses published in this format that you can, that you can already follow about, for example, uh, Navier Stokes, Floyd Dynamics, uh, numerical methods, and this very famous book about probabilistic programming and Bayesian methods for hackers. And the thing is that last year in October, uh, the Nature um, um, the Nature Scientific Journal, which is one of the most important, if not the more important, uh, in life science, published an article about the, the IPython notebook and about its importance, not only in the way that scientists were carrying their work and doing the analysis, but also because of the importance that it had when they wanted to share their results, not only with, uh, with other peers, but also with the public. So it provided to be a very, very nice format to share all these results. Well, many more articles followed about the, not only the use of Python or the IPython notebook, but emphasizing that you can use any other mm, open source tool to carry the job, and that most of the times you can combine them in very nice ways, as we will see after that. But before seeing some practical results, I would like to address some myths or some strange questions that I have to face when people in big companies or people that are not used to the open source tools ask me uh, from time to time. For you, perhaps there is no, no problem with this, but I think there are still many, um, uh, many questions in big companies about what is the point of open source or if it's really reliable. So, well, the first of all is that there is no support, right, because these open source tools are made by volunteers the weekends when the children are sleeping. So, uh, I cannot um, like call anybody on the phone when I have a problem. Uh, the other one is that it won't be free forever. For some reason, I, I've been asked this question a couple of times. And they wonder, okay, this tool is free now, but how do I know that it's going to be free forever? Um, and the other one is that free software has bugs. As the same thing as I said before, like if they are programmed by volunteers, then I have no guarantee that they have any quality measures or any um, thing to assess uh, that the software works properly. So in the first place, uh, this thing that is no support is no longer true. Like we already know that there are many, many companies doing support and doing business using open source. So there's no more question about that, fortunately. This thing about not being free forever, I think many of you know the history about MySQL and MariaDB, OpenOffice and LibreOffice, 
from the time that you already publish a software online and the, that is open, from that point it belongs to the community. So in the end it makes no sense to wonder if it's going to be free or not because if a company tries to retain or tries to close any software then anybody can change the name, take the code and go on with the project. And that free software has bugs? Well, yes. Obviously yes, I think nobody has doubt on this, but it has bugs because of its freedom. Well, also in October 2014, there was a very funny article uh, written by three Spanish mathematicians called The Misfortunes of a Tree of Mathematicians Using Computer Algebra Systems. Uh, computer Algebra Systems are just, for those who don't know, systems who carry on any kind of uh, symbolical analysis, very complex uh, mathematical tasks. And they were trying to compute the determinant of very, very large integer matrices. And they were doing the same computation with Mathematica and with Maple. And they saw that with Mathematica, like they wrote the calculation in one line, it was uh, then they get a result, and if they repeat exactly the same calculation, the following line, they would get a different result. So mm, they were very uh, worried about this because uh, you don't know what result do you want to trust. And they asked Wolfram Research, and they said, "Okay, we have a problem with this uh, software." And the company has, has uh, answered, okay, okay, we are aware of it, thank you very much, we are going to fix it in the, in the next version. And we didn't, they didn't fix it. So there was another version of the software released, but it still had the same bug. So these uh, researchers could not use the software anymore. So the moral of the story in the end is that software has bugs. Like it's uh, a material, if it's free or if it's, if it's not free, and the sooner that we understand that the process of creating software is a process full of problems and mistakes and we have to apply critical reasoning on it every single time, uh, the better it's going to be for all of us. Uh, it's surprising that nobody mentioned it before, but Bloomberg, the company that provides the venue for this conference, uh, published a 38,000 word article explaining what is code. Uh, it's a very, very long read. And actually, I haven't gone through it all still, but it's a very, very worthy article. And in the end, uh, well, it writes about many different topics, like the beginning of computing languages, including some old Fortran. Uh, how do you make applications? What is this open source thing? And the thing is that the following day, they published another article that say, you know, open source is not a password. We do it every single day here. So it's now a real thing. And there are many, many movements now of many companies and many communities that suddenly they are starting to shift the, th the way that they, they envision open source. For example, there are a couple of pieces of news that I gathered when I gave this presentation in, in Stockholm three weeks ago. Uh, the first of them is that you can now visualize IPython notebooks directly on GitHub without uh, using any other external service, which is great. And the other one, like almost the same, well, the same day, that you can now publish books on O'Reilly, which is the um, technical books company publisher that I, we all love, directly with an IPython notebook. And if you think about it, it's perfect because you can mix the explanations with the code and you don't have to, I don't know what's the creation process right now, but I'm not sure it's not as easy as it can be with these kind of tools. And this one I added it, um, some days ago when Apple did the last uh, conference some days ago, they just open sourced uh, the language that they were creating and they announced that it's going to work on Linux. Like this is uh, a very good uh, piece of news and well, not to mention all the movements that Microsoft has been doing in the past also to shift towards open source. Uh, so in the end, uh, it's growing a much bigger interest uh, in, in open source and open source tools. Okay, so when I had the opportunity to talk with Fernando Perez, which is the creator of IPython, like a couple of years ago, I was very enthusiast, enthusiastic in the, at the time, and I asked him, do you, know, do you think that in the future we're going to carry all the scientific computing in Python, all the data analysis and stuff? And he said, of course not. But why would we know that? Why, why would we need to do that because we have many open source tools, many languages, uh, all of them have their strengths, their weaknesses, so why not combine them all? So this is the philosophy behind Jupyter, which is now like the new incarnation of the IPython notebook. For the next version, 
uh, this is gonna be the branding and the name and everything. And if you say, if you see that, it's um, a word play between Julia, Python, and R, which are three different languages very used in scientific computing. In the end, they all separated the language agnostic parts, let's say, so the server, the protocol, and everything, and they created some components to link the backend, let's say, to the language that you are using. So in the end, you can use the same IPython notebook interface that we all know, but with more than 33 languages last time I checked, and more surprises are coming. For example, I don't know if anybody you has carried away any um, signal processes analysis in MATLAB or something like that. Like, well, many, not many, fortunately, because I don't like it very much. Well, but you can use MATLAB in the IPython notebook too if you want. There is an iMATLAB kernel. So if you want, if you like the interface or you want to convince your boss that changing to Python is a good thing, you can say, okay, do you like this interface, these graphs? So we can use exactly the same thing with the language that we already have. So we really don't have to throw away years of effort and work that in the end it's not worth it to throw away. Okay, so enough chat for now. I think I'm on time more or less, so let's Let's switch to a demo to see how all of this works. Mm -mm -mm. What I'm going to open now if LibreOffice allows me. Is well you don't see it. Now you do. Is the website of the nature uh, scientific Journal, the day that they published this uh, scientific article about IPython notebook. As you see here, there you have a, an IPython server running on an iframe, okay? So let's go full screen. Okay, and now here I have a notebook. This is not running in my, in my computer because they have a server somewhere else. Uh, Rackspace provides that, if, I'm, uh, if I call correctly. So, well, there were some examples of things that you can do with the IPython notebook. I don't know uh, for example, because I was not in the tutorials and to uh, how much of the capabilities of the IPython notebook did you use. But well, for example, this is like the simplest thing that you can do. Do you have a matplotlib graph over here? Nothing very special. As you can see, I have all the text and all the equations and everything. And the equations display nicely, actually, which is great. Uh, but for example, here I have a, an example that is a bit more complex which is related to signal processing and data sampling and stuff. If I move this frequency slider here, then you can see that in real time, this is updating the data from the Maplerly graph. If I move this one here, I can change the number of grid points. So it's a way like, if I would like to say, okay, how does this look for uh, 10 frequencies and 10 number of data points, I would like to make 100 graphs but I don't have to anymore because I can uh, do some exploratory analysis in an interactive way. And now with tools like Bokeh and stuff like that, it's even more easier. And another very interesting example about um, image processing, there they have a, a picture of a galaxy from the Hubble Space Telescope, and there they have an algorithm to count the number of galaxies. So if you change the parameters of the algorithm, for example, if I lower the sigma, then we can see that the number of galaxies appearing here is changing, okay? Now I have a lot of them. Also, if I lower the threshold, it's changing to almost in, well, in real time, right? It has to process everything and get it back via wet sockets. Well, and this is the IPython notebook as it was published for the Nature mm, Journal, but there are more things that we can do, for example, Wait a minute. If you want to try live the Jupyter Notebook, you can go to that URL over there, try.jupyter.org. And there are other examples of notebooks that I can use, but we don't only have Python over here, but we also have like even Haskell uh, R, for example. Let's open it. Well, as you can see, it's the, exactly the same interface that we had before, but here I have R code. Okay, I know nothing about R, so I don't understand what I'm doing, but 
I can still run the code and provide the same uh, interface. The graphics is still uh, embedded into the notebook. And there is no change about the, let's say, the, the appearance of the interface. But there is a third thing that we can do, which is even more interesting. No, go back, please. It's a bit uncomfortable. Oh, OK, I did it. So if I create a new Python notebook, in this case, with Python 3, of course, we are in 2015 already. <laughs> so if I import, for example, NumPy as MP, do you see it uh, properly, like from the back, or do I? OK. So if I import NumPy and I create an array, for example, like x equal anything, I don't care. I'm going to copy the, the code for another example that I have here in our blog. No. This screen is quite big. OK. Here's an, an article that we published about working with Python and R at the same time. And for example, if I create an array of points with these points, mm -hmm. OK, they have a NumPy array. And now I can run any uh, R code that I want here. But as I'm working in the Python language, I have to make a switch. So if I write here uh, the perception symbol twice and R, then whatever I write here is going to be R code. OK, and the cool thing is that I can introduce here a variable, like get into it the x variable, which I define outside in the Python side. And if I carry on the computation, OK, if I define this y and this summary, I don't know any r and it's throws. Like, no surprise for anybody, right? So if I carry this computation, Wait a minute, because I have to load an extension first. Not this one. Wait a minute. Mm -mm -mm. Well, I have to load an extension that I don't remember the name still. Wait a minute. So sometimes it's coming. I didn't write this myself, and it shows too. So aha, here it is. OK, I have to load an extension of IPython, which loads the additional capabilities. So OK. Well, now, as I wanted to do, here the uh, R computation performed. Like, I, it introduced the x variable, which was defined in the Python side. And it get into the, the R code, OK, because I'm computing here this, uh, this thing. And not only I can push variables into the computation, but I can also uh, pull them outside. So if I say, for example, that I want the y variable outside, I can run this cell again. And if I go, if I go here, if I print y, it's exactly the same vector that I defined in the R side. OK, so this is uh, like a perfect way. If I want to mix code in different languages, I can directly use the IPython notebook and even exchange variables between both sides. OK, so enough demo for today. Come on. OK, now some final remarks to wrap up the, the talk. Jupyter and IPython, as you have seen, is a very useful tool not only for coding, but also for sharing and exploring some variables and analysis for teaching 
Uh, we don't have to throw away previous work done in different languages or with different technologies because we can reuse all that technology. And open source in general, and Jupyter in particular, is gaining relevance inside not only the business world, let's say, but also in the open science movement, and we must go further than that. So please, the next time that you want to publish a, a scientific article with potential consequences for the lives of many, many people, no more teapots, and thank you very much. <laughs>
I don't know, there's even a Fortran kernel, but I haven't tried because I try to mm, write as less Fortran as I can. <laughs> that sounds like you have some battle scars from uh, writing in Fortran. Well. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Han Luis. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much.